Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your question and then press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard, and we will notify you by email when they are ready for you to review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit to the following poll. If you could give that your attention, we would be most grateful. I'd now like to hand over to Ian Manchoa, CEO, and Tom Mooland, CFO of Gresham Technologies. Good afternoon to you both. Um, Mark, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, so I'm Ian Minocha, um, and uh, I'll kick off the presentation. It's a fairly full session, actually, um, and, but, but we will aim to leave a good chunk of time for questions at the end. Um, so in, in terms of the, the running order for today, um, for, first of all, I want to start with a few thoughts on how we're doing against the group's strategic plan. Um, we'll then touch on some of the operational highlights um, for 2020. Uh, and then quite a big chunk of uh, information really looking at uh, the business across a number of different dimensions. So uh, Tom will cover a significant amount of the business analysis session. Uh, and then towards the end, I'll wrap up by talking a little bit about our vision, uh, where we're going with the products, and then share with you some information around our go-to-market plan um, and our uh, plans for 2021. I, I guess just to summarize how we feel about 2020, um, a, a terrible year, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, for a lot of people um, in business. Um, we, we're pretty pleased with how we landed, um, slightly behind um, our original plan, but actually given everything that happened, as I said, we're pleased with, with what we achieved. Uh, and I think the headlines are very much around the ARR growth, Clarity ARR up 29%, um, two new tier one bank wins, and I'll talk about how important those are for us when I talk about key accounts later on. Uh, and then also another highlight from last year really is the, in, the acquisition of Inferalgo, which is really important um, to help us build our regulatory business. Um, so diving straight in then, in terms of the group strategic plan, as I, I think many of you will be familiar, the old Gresham of 10 years ago uh, which was very much a services business and uh, a reseller of technology and um, a licensor of some of our own very, very old data center technology. Uh, that, that group um, uh, from 10 years ago, um, we've been on a strategic plan really to transform the company into a high growth, high margin, modern financial technology company based um, with a business model based on recurring software licensing. Uh, and 2020 was another good step in progress along that journey. You can see on the slide here that the blue bars are what we uh, refer to really as our legacy business. Um, and we've been surprisingly able to hold that legacy business in and around a similar number over time, but it is in structural decline and so the challenge for us and the exciting part of our business is to build out the clarity business um, such that that legacy business is no longer relevant. Uh, and over time, clarity, we've, we've delivered 45% um, compound annual growth over the last five years. In the last two years, we've made the really important transition of that business towards a subscription licensing business. And we've also made a further step on the road towards clarity being standalone, cash profitable business. Uh, and we'll explore all of these points a little later on. The other thing to highlight um, and helped of course by our acquisitions and helped by the organic growth in the clarity business is that recurring software now comprises 61% of group revenues. So that's up slightly on last year. Um, so, diving into last year there and look, looking at some of the operational highlights, um, very pleased to have secured two new Tier 1 bank wins. Um, so, both of these wins are strategically important for us. 
Uh, one of those wins we will announce publicly later on this week. We've got uh, agreement from the institution uh, to make some public statements about them. Um, and I'm pleased to say that that's Santander. Um, and the business that we won is with their UK business. And there's a really nice write-up uh, about that that we will share on our website later in the week. Essentially, what we're doing there is we're helping modernize the control framework within their UK business, um, which is very much a retail and commercial banking business and payments business. The other tier one bank win is with one of the world's largest uh, financial uh, groups, uh, and I'm not able to name that business, um, but we will be working with their US organization um, to, again, modernize their controls within their trading business, their global trading business. So two important wins. Um, and, you know, cracking these tier one accounts is really important because over time, we can expect to see substantial growth within all of our key accounts. Um, and so bringing a couple of new businesses on um, during a difficult COVID year was, was really important. We also, also saw good growth within our existing install base uh, and saw several upgrades in, in our major accounts last year as well. Uh, the other thing that I'm very pleased about last year is um, that the two tier one bank wins that we made in Q1 of 2019, um, both of those deals were into the core banking area, into their core cash and securities processing. Um, and they were flagship wins, high value wins. And I'm pleased to say that the um, implementations of those two um, banks uh, saw their first go lives during 2020. Um, and they continue to move more and more of their global businesses onto our platform and will be both wrapping up those implementations in the coming months. Um, but those first go lives were very important last year. And as I said, these are flagship wins, not just for us, but actually they're, they're industry firsts because in the tier one global investment um, banking world, to replace a core post-trade processing platform is a once in a generation event. Um, and so we're delighted that these, uh, um, these customers will become outstanding references for us moving forward. Uh, I've already mentioned the acquisition of Inferalgo as being a, a really good step forward. Um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to say that business has already been completely integrated. Um, we only had them in the business for five months last year. Uh, it was earnings enhancing within that period. Um, and uh, they achieved the numbers that we expected them to achieve. Uh, and as I said, they're fully integrated um, and the Gresham sales team um, is now building pipeline for the combined offerings. Now I'll say a few words on that a little later on. So that's been, I think, a, a very good success for us as well. The strategic partnership that we have with ANZ and the innovation service where we're jointly developing a new digital corporate banking offering. Um, that um, partnership has progressed well. We've achieved the milestones that we wanted to during 2020, uh, and we'll be looking to go live with them um, in the summer, I would say the Northern Hemisphere summer uh, of this year. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that those milestones that we have achieved um, have uh, therefore pulled through additional licensing. Uh, and you'll see that again on some of the slides a little later on. So I think those are some of the highlights um, for us in the business last year. Um, I, I guess it's also worth saying, um, you know, that it's obviously a very difficult year with the COVID period going on, uh, particularly difficult for our customers. Uh, and our customers in capital markets saw extraordinary trading volumes, extraordinary market volatility. Um, and it's really important to them that our software and our support for them was maintained at the highest standards. Um, and uh, we didn't miss a beat on that, um, which is really important for their confidence in us as a partner. Um, we also, through last year, um, work, took the opportunity to work on our uh, company positioning, our product positioning, uh, and obviously advance some of our product development plans, uh, and also um, strengthen the sales and marketing team. And some of you who were with me and Tom on this call um, at the half year may recall that we were saying we were rebuilding the sales and marketing team. 
Um, I'm very pleased to say that we've got a strong team in place, uh, all headcount filled, um, and uh, I, I think it's the strongest and most experienced team we've had, uh, certainly in the five or six years that I've been in the business. So I guess those are the highlights um, from last year. Uh, in terms of the numbers themselves, um, you will have seen these, of course. Um, I, I think for me, probably the most important KPI for the long-term health growth sustainability of the business is what we're doing on the Clarity ARR. Uh, and that's obviously up 29%, um, roughly split 17% uh, organic and the rest uh, through the Inferalgo five-month contribution. Um, at the revenue level, uh, both at the group revenue level and at the Clarity revenue level, we're flat. Um, but as Tom will show you, it's important to look under the, the covers at that because one aspect of, um, of that, of course, is our shift to subscription. Um, on the earnings side, I'm sure you're pleased to have seen the small uh, upgrade in earnings that we delivered towards the tail end of last year. Um, and generally on EPS going in the right direction. Uh, and on the cash side, very strong position, no debt in the business. Um, and Tom, again, will talk about the cash uh, numbers a little later on. Um, but we're pleased with that outcome, especially considering the outflow for the acquisition of Inferalgo. So I, I said that the Clarity ARR is probably our most important KPI. Um, and this slide very helpfully shows how we've built that really strong, sticky, recurring software license business year on year. Um, in part, organic, which is the orange blocks that we've added, and then in part, of course, um, small um, uh, you know, technology-based acquisitions, uh, three of them in the last four years. I think the important thing to bring out here on this slide is actually the pie chart in the top right-hand corner. Um, so of that recurring revenue base now, 87% of that is on subscription. Um, and that's been a, a marked shift helped over our concerted efforts to move away from perpetual and term-based licensing in our organic business. And also, of course, the acquisitions that we've made, we've been careful at selecting businesses that are themselves 100% subscription. Um, so all of this plays towards the quality of earnings um, moving forward, uh, which Tom will again talk about a little later on. Um, in terms of the distribution of the business um, globally, um, we've obviously progressed a long way from where we were six or seven years ago, which was essentially a UK and Australia-based business into a much more international business. Um, it's really good to see nearly 30% of the business coming now from North America. Um, and, but I would say, in fact, um, we, we've got a lot more we can be doing in North America. It's the largest global market. Uh, and I still feel that we're underweight in North America compared to the market opportunity. Um, but it's pleasing to see um, how internationally uh, spread the business is now. Um, and, uh, you know, and you can see there finally also that, um, you know, we're starting to build out our regulatory business that now represents 13% of the business uh, alongside the core business, which is data integrity and control which is the first kind of use case for clarity um, that we started um, all those years ago back in um, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of 2011, 2012 period. Um, okay, so that's clarity ARR. Um, let, let's take a step back up now and look at group revenues. And this slide also covers off not just clarity revenues, but our longer term legacy business. So Tom, if I may, I'll pass to you to talk around this one. Yeah, thanks, Ian. So ju just as a reminder, what we've been looking at on the previous slide was our, our clarity forward looking ARR. So as at the 31st of December 2020, we had 12.3 million of contracted clarity revenues to recognize during 2021 that we then fully expect to recur annually thereafter. What we're looking at now is, is, of course, the revenue that has run through our profit and loss account um, or income statement uh, over the last 12 months. So, in fact, over the last uh, last five or six years. So 
won't talk too much about clarity now because we'll have a little we'll have a look a bit deeper at, at that on on the next slides but really just wanted to to remind those of you who are, who are less or remind those of you who are familiar with the business and, and, and make those of you who are less familiar with the business aware of some of the non-clarity revenue streams and uh, the, the, the makeup of them. So the first one here is software partners. Uh, so this is the resale of third party software um, come from a co company called Cashback. We now have a single customer left there, there with multiple uh, corporate customers um, that we, we don't proactively sell this any longer. And the uptick in it from 2019 to 2020 is largely as a result of that uh, customers, uh, end customers increasing their usage, increasing the number of accounts that they are, are putting through, through the software. Um, we, we expect this to, 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 to increase slightly, but not significantly as though those end customers continue to, to, to increase their usage of the software. Um, you know, we, we have really good visibility of the software partners, in fact, of all of the non-clarity um, revenue streams, at least 12 to 18 months out. So whilst it's, it's correct, so it's in, in structural decline, um, it's, we, we, we have uh, a fair amount of, of certainty as to how, how quickly that, that decline will occur. Um, you'll see we state the, the, the margins here for each of the non-clarity uh, business lines. And the, these are bottom line margins. So on the software partners side of the house, or really that should just say partner now, although historically it was partners, we are, we are talking about a 50% bottom, bottom line margin. Um, and, and that's a fairly fixed margin. So you know we, we have a huge amount of predictability of our cost base there. Software owned solutions. So this is our own IP. This is technology that generates that that that, um, that, that was generated thirty plus years ago. Um, again, it's in in structural decline. We don't actively sell it. Our um, cost to maintain this this revenue stream is that of of, of two part time employees, effectively one one FTE. Um, so the bottom line margin there really is at ninety percent plus. Um, you will see the drop off uh, being fairly consistent year on year until we get to the to, to the drop between eighteen and nineteen. That that more pronounced drop between those two years was as a result of our the, the, our sale of our VME business to Fujitsu. Um, so there was a a more pronounced drop uh, between those years, and then we the the twenty percent ish um, reduction year on year. As, as sort of continued continued on there, um, this is clearly having a, a less meaningful impact uh, or to to our group numbers, but but still continues to, to to generate good levels of cash to reinvest in clarity. Uh, we, we've got again fairly good visibility of this. We, we expect the, the this revenue stream to completely run off within three years. Um, although I would say we, we, we have been uh, continuously surprised of the longevity of these streams. The services contracting side of the house, this is one customer. This is a, a, another facet of our relationship with ANZ in Australia. Um, this is us providing people to augment their own internal IT team um, as they bring agility into their own internal IT programs. Uh, we get paid uh, quarterly in advance and ANZ sign SOWs 12 months in, in advance. The margins on it, including a margin on our administrative costs to run the, this, this business are 13%. So it is low margin, but again, very, very predictable, um, predictable cost base there. This does move around a little bit year on year, depending upon the exact amount of uh, resourcing needs that ANZ have. Um, but, but as I said, we, we have very good visibility of it sort of 12 to 18 months out, and we expect this to remain reasonably stable, potentially even a slight tick up in, uh, in 2020. Again, that's not a business that we proactively sell. So to move on and have a look 
at the clarity uh, uh, revenue streams in a bit more detail. Um, on the software side of the house, we'll see, um, you know, historically we used to have this, these bright blue bars um, that, that demonstrate the non-recurring software revenue. Now that includes both the, the non-annually recurring element of term licenses, and also when in the early days of Clarity when we used to sell some perpetual licenses. Um, in line with our strategy to move to 100% subscription model, we have not got any um, non-recurring elements coming through in, in 2020, which is ple pleasing to see. Um, so you can see the strong um, subscription revenue growth from 10.4 million to 11.5 million. Clearly, um, the full year impact of the um, subscription deals won during 2020 will will come through and will come through into the FY21 numbers once we have a full year's benefit of, of those numbers coming through. And, and equally, once we have a full year's benefit of the Infralgo acquisition, that within this 11.5, only, uh, only five months worth is contributed. On the Clarity Services side of the house, so this is us providing implementation services to help our customers be successful with, with, with the Clarity platform. It's us providing health checks, training, et cetera. Um, we saw very strong performance in the Asia Pacific re region, um, again, largely driven by ANZ's, um, ANZ's usage of, of Clarity software as well. Um, but it is fair to say that this, the, the, the Clarity Services revenue lines were impacted by lower um, ad hoc services coming through as a result of COVID. We really did see a sort of six month um, hiatus on new contracts, whatever they may be, whether they be um, new services contracts to accompany new software licenses, whether they be extensions to existing services contracts, health checks, training, whatever that might be, there was a, certainly a, a four to six month lull in anything new being signed. And we're seeing the, the, the impact of that come through in those FY20 numbers. The, the, the other reason for, this, for the slight reduction on the prior year there is the two big tier one wins at the start of, of 2000 and that we won at the start of 2019 that Ian alluded to earlier in the cash and security space. Um, those uh, Im implementations, successful implementations, we did invest a little more than we originally intended to on those, which which pulled through revenue at a, at a slightly lower rate that, than was originally intended. Um, but you know, those you know, those have been uh, been successful investments to, to to get those customers live and and, and as Ian said, game changing for, for for the industry, not just for, for us. So now to move on and have a look at the Clarity cost base. So again, this is just the, the, the Clarity side of things because the non-Clarity cost base with it largely being fixed margin very much takes care of itself. On the For the Clarity cost base, and, and this slide here that we're looking at now is the gross cash, cash spend by function. So what we mean by that is it's agnostic to whether we can capitalize R&D or not. It's agnostic to IFRS 16 and whether leasing costs are classified as interest or, or, or depreciation. This is the true cash spend going through the through the, the, the clarity business. I'll come back to talking about sales and marketing in, in a moment. But if we have a look at our development, customer success and delivery, so that's our, our implementation and services business and uh, our corporate functions, they're all relatively flat year on year. And in actual fact, the step up from 18 to 19 was very much as a result of our acquisition of the B2 group that occurred during that year. So we've remained relatively flat in all of those functions year on year for, for, for a number of years. Um, within that, clearly there's some savings in T&E as a result of COVID, um, where we have had um, uh, you know, voluntary levers and so on during the the, the, the year, we, we have not immediately replaced all um, as a sort of COVID response type, type measure. But once we got confidence in our ability to sell in a COVID world, as we did uh, during certainly during Q3 of, of, of last year, 
we started to 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 um to, to, to invest again and we started to 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 open open up for hiring be it replacement heads or, or new heads called out Inferalgo separately which which the acquisitions that represents five months worth of costs that is, that is fully integrated um and next year we will see it being fully integrated into the into these functions but thought it appropriate to show show separately uh in in the year of acquisition now on the sales and marketing side of the house that that there's a there's a few things going on in this this reduction in spend from from 2019 what one is um off the back of the fact that we in 2019 we sold our our, our last term license so with that non-recurring element and the commission um, expense running through the PL uh matches the revrec so effectively there's a an acceleration there was an acceleration of commission expense to to, to match the rev rec in 2019 which accounts for some some of that uh some of that reduction year on year um the the, the other piece is clearly uh t and e was was lower as, as a result of covid and also ian mentioned the the the, the refresh that we commenced at the back end of 2019 and we talked about a year ago and and, and six months ago uh, of our sales and marketing team generally that as we were embarking upon that you know we we did um take a to take a moment to 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 uh to to assess the world during covid just to ensure that we were able to to sell before we we, we really pulled the trigger on some of those investments that we were looking to make both investments and and replacement heads we'd expect to see the the set this sales and marketing bar uh, for 2021, at least at the levels of of 2019, um, you know th this what this certainly isn't is a is a cost cutting in sales and marketing, um, but more as a as a result of those uh, those points that I just mentioned. So now just to to move on and and, and how does that how does all of that flow through to group earnings and, and profitability? Now again, both of these charts show show cash. A bit there. So again, this is agnostic to whether we can we can capitalize R and D and um, and uh, IFRS sixteen those leasing costs. So that they are treated as as cash costs in these uh, cash EBITDA numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, blue bars at the top, the the cash being generated by the non clarity uh, businesses that has been reinvested in clarity. You can see quite clearly through this th through these these charts. Can see the, the the fall off between 2017 and 2018 um, as one major legacy customer um, reduced their 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 usage significantly. You can actually see since then, whilst the the makeup of those legacy businesses have, has changed, and the there has been a, a slight fall in absolute contribution of of, of those groups. It's remained relatively flat, and there haven't been those severe um, cliff edges that we we saw three or four years ago. We expect that actually to continue um, at, at relatively flat levels, certainly for the next next eighteen months or so. Um, and, and we'll look to to to, to optimise those, those businesses to continue to contribute towards clarity. Now, um, on the clarity side of things, um, clearly you can see the the impact of the the, the move to the full subscription model um, coming through, uh, but you can see the, the, the general increased or increased move towards uh, cash profitability of that clarity business. And you know, one of the things that we are, we, we are managing carefully is that balance between how quickly do we look to, look to move towards cash profitability versus investing that legacy, legacy cash that's generated in uh, distribution and sales and marketing and taking advantage of that market opportunity that we we, we, we have right now but um but but we we're, we're expecting um but based upon the, the the plan we have in place for clarity to become cash generative in its own right in 2022 so we'd expect to see another uh, a, another negative year in 2021 um to, to to map that to our our plans to invest in, in in distribution 
So equally, just to look at the uh, quality of, of, of clarity earnings uh, from, from another perspective, you can see the percentage of clarity revenues that, that, that are recurring now. So continuing to increase, we're up at 74% now. And we'd expect that to continue to increase over time as our uh, uh, as our um, recurring ARR book of business continues to grow. Um, but equally, we see it, we see it continuing to improve here. The coverage of our clarity cost base solely through recurring revenue is in, is is continuing to, to to improve as well. What that gives us is it is clearly a a, a, a group that is incredibly significantly more resilient than it ever has been and clarity as a standalone being a, a an attractive standalone proposition um but you know clearly we will look to to optimize those those legacy businesses as best we can for the coming years so now just to move on and, and have a look at our, our our cash position so in in short we're we're, we're in a, a very strong cash position if we have have a look, these are our, our uh, cash balances at the at the end of each each fiscal year. Um, you can see a slight reduction between two thousand nineteen and two thousand and twenty. But what we do have to remember in two thousand and twenty is we paid out a gross cash amount of two point three million for the acquisition of Inferalgo. Um, we also had lower net tax re receipts um, uh, compared to to the prior year. Uh, in the prior year, we had 1.3 million of cash receipts, cash tax receipts. This year, 0.8 million. Um, to, to delve into that a little bit, little bit deeper, what actually happened was we had about 1.3 million of net tax, of oh, oh, sorry, gross tax receipts um, off the back of our, our UK R and D um, credits that we're we're able to make use of. Um, but that was offset by the fact that in the US and in Australia, we've become tax payable. So there's about half a million of tax paid in those th those countries as well. Um, clearly, we paid out on a on, on a dividend as well during um, during this the, the summer at uh, 0.75 pence per share, and uh, we we will be proposing at the AGM a, uh, a dividend of a of a similar level. So with that, I will hand back over to Ian to talk about our key accounts. Um, <clears throat> great, thank you, Tom. Um, and I can start to see some questions coming through, um, which I'll uh, aim to pick up either Tom or I as we go through the rest of the, the presentation. Um, just want to say a few words on key accounts. Uh, and actually, we have shared uh, this form of slide some time ago. I thought it would be helpful to show an update. So um, these are four customers. It's the same four customers that we showed uh, when you last saw this slide. Um, and it really brings home how important key accounts are for us. So in our marketplace, um, really key accounts are tend to be those larger global investment banks, large regional banks, um, larger buy-side firms, or in some cases, large corporates. Um, and we call them key accounts if we make a judgment that says, we think we can grow the relationship with this customer such that they are delivering at least half a million pounds per annum of um, recurring license. Uh, and in, within our portfolio of you know 120 customers now, actually, we, we've got a number of those. But um, the four that we have here, let me just talk to you because I think it's quite a good example of how we open up an account uh, and then can find ways to do more with them. Um, so customers A and B actually are the two early adopters of Clarity. They were both customers going back to that 2012-2013 uh, 20, 20, period, um, and the revenues first started to kick in materially in 2014. So um, customer A um, happens to be ANZ, um, and you can see that that account has grown steadily year on year on year. Um, and then we got a nice, quite significant step up between 19 and 20. Uh, and the reason for that is predominantly um, the result of the innovation work, the joint development work that we've been doing with them, achieving milestones whereby uh, they're starting to license from us the technology that we've been developing. 
So you can see that steady progress at, at the, in ANZ. Um, they, of course, are a very important client for us across the entirety of our business. Um, and you can expect to see that uh, growth continue in the coming years. If I jump to customer C, so that's the bright blue, um, we first won uh, that account in 2018. Um, we won a project uh, around regulatory control, helping them ensure that the regulatory reporting that they do in their European business and their Asia business uh, for G20 based um, regulations, um, ensuring that that data was complete and accurate and timely and that they could have confidence in their regulatory submissions. They were very pleased with what we did um, in that project. And in 2019, they went on to do another regulatory project in the US uh, and also um, a significant project to replace their core processing uh, on their cash and, secu cash and uh, securities business globally. Uh, and then in 2020, um, they drew down some more licenses and actually made a long-term commitment uh, to us as well. So a new multi-year agreement in place. So again, it's another very good example where you know, we can open up these large global investment banks um, and build that relationship over time. And of course, you know, they have very deep pockets when it comes to spend on financial technology. So you know, our feeling here is that if we continue to do a great job for them, if we continue to invest in innovation, um, you know, then we'll continue to grow that relationship um, year on year over time. Uh, and then customer D, um, we first uh, became a customer in 2019. Uh, and then um, in the summer of this year, um, we announced um, that they had uh, done a large deal with us to cover their UK business. And I, I actually talked about um, that, that organization earlier on. So this is just an example of four key accounts, which over four or five year period, you know, has has delivered exceptionally strong growth for us. Um, last year, we won further key accounts. Um, and in our pipeline, we also have key accounts. So, you know, th these will become increasingly critical for us. And and growth can come generally from signing up framework agreements, which enables them to purchase and consume software really easily. Um, and then, of course, you know, rolling that technology out across their subsidiaries, across different use cases, um, you know, and more users and more volumes. Um, so that's really it on key accounts. Um, let me just take a step back now and just talk a little bit more generally about strategy and where we're going. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about 2021. Uh, and within my comments around 2021, I'll pick up on uh, one of the key questions that's come through, which is what keeps me awake at night, um, which is, of course, um, you know, in, in today's world, very much about ensuring that we can build pipeline. So m moving on then and talking a little bit about um, really the, the vision and strategy for the company. Those of us uh, that have been following the Clarity journey over um, the last five, six, seven years, you will have seen that we've moved from that original investment in a next generation matching and reconciliation technology. We've taken that core investment. We've built on it to build out a data integrity and data quality capability. And we've built on it the ability to not just do reconciliations, but also provide controls for companies. Um, and um, we've now seen an opportunity, which we've been working towards and one business in, um, to, to go forward with a more holistic play. Um, so a lot of what we were doing in our early days was automating manual processes. But with the wave of digital transformation that has, of course, grabbed you know, all industries and the financial services industry is no different. Um, an awful lot of firms are concerned now that their digital processes are doing what they expect to do. And um, that example of the bank that we'd won 
um, in the summer of last year that I said we'd do um, some further press work on this week is a good example of that. Um, they've got you know automated digital processes for their retail banking, uh, for their payments business, but they need to know that every single customer journey is um, completing correctly, that they're treating customers fairly, there is integrity to every single payment that they make, and that they can follow the life cycle of um, you know, the customer relationship, the life cycle of the transaction. Um, and so having confidence in digital is really important. Um, and that's essentially our vision as a company, is to bring integrity to digital, uh, and of course also to uh, enable firms to be much more agile and have confidence in their processing. In terms of what that means for our products and offerings, um, we've done a fair amount of work as we continue to invest heavily in, uh, in innovation and R&D, as well as our acquisitions, um, to try to simplify um, the incredible power of our software into, um, into ways that customers can really understand. Um, and so you're familiar with the concept of the Clarity platform. Um, and um, that platform is, of course, available in the cloud. And an increasing proportion of our customers are, um, are now in the cloud. Um, and we really now offer two primary um, sets of solutions, one that we call Clarity Control and one that we call Clarity Connect. And actually, you can see the split of business. Uh, the split of ARR there as well. So Clarity Control is all about the ingestion, the matching and reconciling of data, and the application of business rules to ensure that the data is um, and the processes um, are behaving um, in the way that the organization wants them to. Um, and we've developed specific applications for different use cases. We've got Clarity transaction control for complex non-standard data that you find in inter-systems problems. We've got Clarity cache control and Clarity securities control for exactly the you know, processing of uh, cash and securities within global investment banks or um, buy-side firms. And we've got Clarity regulatory control, which brings additional functionality that's required for those firms that, that are looking at the quality of their data in a more sy systemic way, um, and, and their regulatory report, re reporting is more of a data quality play than a transaction quality play. So we've packaged all of those solutions up. We sell them as control solutions, um, and um, you know we've got very strong USPs in all of those areas. On the connect side, um, those of you that have followed our development as a company will be familiar with some of the acquisitions we've made. So our Connect capabilities, we acquired C24, and that brought us financial messaging, transformation, and connectivity capability. For example, the ability to uh, connect to and ingest swift messaging. Um, we acquired B2, which gave us the ability to connect up to multiple banks on a host-to-host -host basis. And we acquired um, Inferalgo, which gave us straight through processing uh, and connectivity to regulatory reporting venues. So all of those uh, acquisitions and our own in-house developments, we brought together now under the Connect banner. And it's an incredibly rich set of connectivity services. And the real power of what we do with Clarity is when we bring these capabilities together for a client. So a really good example, um, you know, would be where, um, you know, a client needs to, for example, do regulatory reporting. So they use clarity control to take data out of all, all of their internal systems, to validate it, apply rules to it, prepare it uh, into a format that can be submitted to the regulator. They use Clarity Connect to submit that data to the regulator in real time and to get feeds back from the regulator. 
and then they use clarity control to manage the exceptions. So the power of having these capabilities is that we can deliver complete higher value end-to-end -end solutions for our customers. And that's just one example, but there are many others um, where you know the power of the platform and the um, you know the two core capabilities um, is really quite differentiated in the market. Um, so let me just pick up on one of the questions while I'm on this slide. Um, a, a question around, is there a business case for changing the group name to Clarity? Um, I, I think there is an argument there. Um, we, we see very much Clarity as a, as a product brand um, and Gresham as the company level brand. And if we were to rename the company as Clarity, it would without doubt have some good name recognition in the market in the short term. But if we think about our long term aspirations, um, you know, it's quite it's quite probable that we will will we will want to build out in the longer term products that don't necessarily sit under the clarity brand quite as well. Um, and so I wouldn't want us to close out that possibility by naming the company after the product. So that's really our thinking around uh, the clarity brand. Um, but I think, you know, uh, in European markets and the US market in particular, you know, both the Gresham name and the Clarity name are, are getting good name recognition now, which is a significant step forward from a few years ago. Um, moving on to our go to market plan. Um, and um, really, here's our plan on the page. Um, it's very much about those offerings. Um, connect and control in the cloud, um, our promise to customers around the ensuring that they can have confidence in their data and processes, um, can be agile uh, and have um, and run their digital businesses with integrity. That's our promise to customers. Um, we really take that to market um, under three core initiatives, reconciliations, regulatory, and data integrity and control. Really, that's the that's the way that customers buy, that they're known categories and, and they look for solutions to problems in those uh, in those three categories. We're very much focused on uh, six core uh, industry segments, uh, sell side banking, um, both the um, on the trading book and on the banking book. Uh, in the buy side with investment managers, large hedge, hedge funds, asset managers, energy and commodities, where we've actually got some very good customers. Um, and, and indeed, uh, you know, I should have mentioned earlier in the year, but uh, earlier in the presentation, in 2020, we saw good incremental growth from uh, one of our energy customers. That's one of the world's largest energy companies. Um, we also have several insurance broker customers and customers in wealth management and other uh, non-bank financial uh, segments. Um, for example, FX trading, uh, Bitcoin, uh, contracts for difference. There's a variety of other um, uh, financial segments where you know the data is messy and non-standard where we have a good fit. Uh, and our focus for 2021 is in US and Canada, where I've already said I feel we're underweight in the UK and Western Europe, uh, and then um, to build our business in Asia, uh, where we're relocating a, a senior salesperson, as we speak, in fact, out to Singapore uh, to take on our, our, our Asia business. Um, and with all of this going on, really, I think, you know, what, what keeps us awake at night is very much about ensuring that we keep building pipeline. We've got a really good track record of executing well on opportunities when they come into the pipeline. Uh, in 2020, um, as uh, both Tom and I have described earlier on, there was a period where our, our pipeline really slowed significantly. Um, our prospects simply were not engaging on new projects. Um, and it's really important that we keep that pipeline moving. Um, since October of last year, we've seen uh, projects starting to move and indeed the first quarter of this year so far we've had significant number of new RFPs uh, you know proposal requests tender requests come in so pipelines picking up 
very nicely, and I'm you know I'm confident we'll have a, a you know a good first half. Um, but we absolutely have got to build pipeline um, into uh, the second half of this year. Uh, and as everyone on the call will be well aware, you know, even though you know there are many many good signs um, in terms of the you know the economics, and we are clearly focused on a very relevant part of the market in terms of digital transformation and intelligent automation. You know, the the the, uh, the macro factors are still somewhat uncertain. Um, but as I say, I'm confident we've got a good first half ahead of us. Um, moving on uh, to the 2021 plan, I, I won't talk to this slide. I am conscious of time. Um, but but really, here's some some sort of information really to to, to have a read on uh, later on after the call. Um, but really, what we've done on this slide is set out where we are in terms of achievements, and then set out our priorities in terms of sales and marketing, in terms of product development, uh, in terms of our brand and messaging, and then also our thoughts on M and A. Um, and I notice actually there's there is a question there. Um, on m a so let me just play a, a um, make a couple of comments on that um, we've very successfully now done three relatively small uh, m a transactions all uh, on you know subscription based businesses all in bis in uh, businesses that fit very well to our core offering uh, and all into spaces in the market that are growing. Uh, and I think for each of those transactions, we've, you know, we've actually got good value as well. And and um, and, and we've uh, the management team has done an excellent job actually of integrating and driving returns from from those acquisitions. Um, where we stand today, I actually think the bolt-on phase of our uh, M and A strategy, um, you know, has uh, proved itself extremely well for us. And we've got work, I think, now to really drive. Um, the the growth opportunity out of um, those uh, those three transactions, it's it's given us a a, a much more holistic uh, technology play, particularly around what I described as the connect um, side of our proposition, um, and so we've really got no further plans to to look for. Um, small bolt-on acquisitions for the foreseeable future. Um, I think what would be more interesting, but but of course these opportunities don't come along very often, is is to look at how we can substantially scale up the business with more transformative M and A. Um, and uh, what I would say on that is, you know, we really over the last five years we've kept our eye in the market for M and A opportunities and. It's absolutely not uh, something that we would do lightly. Um, we've got an absolutely fab fabulous business here that's driving good organic growth um, with high quality revenues, good quality customers. So we'll keep an eye out in the market for something that may take us to the next level, um, but not at the expense of um, you know, dropping the ball on our um, you know, outstanding um, you know, an innovative organic business. Um, so let me just take a quick look at the questions here and, and see whether I can pick up any any others. Ian, maybe I could just jump in just to give you a small pause so you can yeah. um, review those. Um, later, Darren, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. But just why um, Ian and Tom take a few moments to review the investor questions already submitted, I'd like to remind you that a copy of the recording of this presentation, along with the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard and we'll send you an email to let you know when they're ready for you to review. Um, I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately after this presentation has ended you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations and it's incredibly value valuable to the company so would would very much ask you to devote a bit of time to doing that. Um, Ian I, I've done my best to give you as much as I can and I did notice that you answered a number of these questions throughout the presentation um, but if I could ask you just to click on the Q&A tab perhaps read out the question um, and then give a response where it's appropriate and then I'll take the floor back and then we'll ask for a few words to wrap up. 
Yes, thank you, Mark. So I, I think I've covered off the what keeps you awake at night question. Uh, the, there's a question around, is there a business case for changing the group name to Clarity? I've touched on that. Um, there's a question around M&A, um, and, and I've also touched on that. So uh, one other question there, um, are there any customer segments of particular interest to drive revenue? And what's the typical sales cycle? Um, so on that one, if I just jump back to our plan on the page, um, in terms of the segments that we're after, um, really, you know, in terms of geographic markets, the most important for us is to is to scale up in the U.S. Uh, given the the U.S. market represents nearly fifty percent of the global market for um, our technology into um, into the capital markets industry. In terms of the customer segments, I, I think we've made really good progress in tier one banks. Um, and uh, the win that I've described with Santander is a first foray into the retail commercial banking side of banking. Um, and that's a really interesting play where I think we can scale up again further in, in that area. I would say that sales into the large banks takes longer. Uh, it's more expensive. It's more, um, you know, their procurement processes and their requirements are more robust in terms of the level of uh, engagement that they expect uh, and the scale of sometimes the proof of concept. So we do need to be careful um, there that we don't get all consumed by poorly qualified opportunities. Um, investment management remains a very strong area um, for us and is um, in terms of the number of firms, you know, there are well over a thousand uh, investment managers, asset managers uh, and hedge funds of subs um, of substantial enough scale to be of interest to us. Um, so that's a market that we have particular interest in, although the deal sizes are generally lower, um, and the, but the sales cycles um, are actually a little shorter. They tend to be more like nine month sales cycles, whereas the banks can be 12 months. That's um, perfect. I think so I yeah, I think that's probably it in terms of all of the questions, um, Mark. That is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And, and nearly spot on to the hour as well. So thank you very much indeed. Um, Ian, Tom, before perhaps I redivert investors to give feedback, maybe a few words just to, to close up um, and then I'll uh, end the session. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I, I guess to summarise, um, difficult year for, for so many businesses in 2020. We're very, very pleased with where we landed. 29% um, ARR growth. Um, really good progress around the quality of earnings um, that Tom's described um, and good progress, therefore, towards getting clarity to be standalone cash profitable. Uh, and I think excellent progress against our strategic agenda. Um, and, um, you know, the big prize here, which is shown on this final slide, you know, we, we absolutely believe that, you know, this business can be a hundred million recurring business over time. We're very focused on making Gresham a global fintech champion of substantial scale. Uh, and we'll do that through, you know, stepping up the organic growth post COVID, uh, as well as keeping an eye on the M&A agenda. So it's exciting times ahead. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody's support for your company uh, and uh, for maintaining the dialogue as we proceed. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, both to Ian and to Tom. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, then the feedback page will appear. If you access this meeting via the link sent to you by email, you'll simply be asked to log back in um, and to submit your feedback. But as I said earlier, if you could, that would be very beneficial to the company. On behalf of the management team of Gresham Technologies PLC, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all.